every year since 1943. It's the production of a World Series highlight film, which is commissioned each year by Major League Baseball. In the past, these films have been kind of hard to find, but now a limited number being made available. The World Series films have an interesting history. They've been in color since 1959, and since 1982, they haven't been on film at all, but videotape productions. Beginning in 1969, they've contained material not seen on television, including, in some films, exclusive interviews, sound from wireless microphones, and camera angles not seen on the TV coverage. Since all the videos being released are of classic World Series, you may have a tough time deciding which ones to watch first. But for right now, get comfortable and relax, because you're about to watch America's premier sporting event. The World Series. Beating the Yankees, I think, in that the third game the other night was the most excited I've been. Oh, this is fabulous. This is about the greatest thing ever happened to Kansas City, I'll tell you. George Brett against Rich Gossage. Two down. Wilson at second. Washington at first. Fastball. Drilled to right field. Back it goes. It's gone. Brad has just hit a towering three-run homer. The Royals lead the Yankees 4-2, and now they're just nine outs away from their first American League pennant. Dan Quisenberry is being mobbed by his teammates. After coming so close so many times, the World Series will be coming to Kansas City. No question about it. They were going to beat Houston all up. They just wanted to make it to the last minute to make it like drag, you know, drag it out and make it look really good. This actually is bigger for us, I think, than the bicentennial, you know. Gary Maddox stands in, Unser at third, two outs, top of the tenth. LaCordy's pitch. Maddox swings, line drive, center field. Poole can't get it. Unser scores, and the Phillies lead eight to seven. Unbelievable. This team just won't quit. The Bills have come from behind again. The Phillies have done it. It took 30 years and five murderous games with Houston, but finally the Bills are going to the World Series. I've been waiting 30 years for this, and I, four in a row, I guarantee it. We've waited a long time, but it's worth the wait. Sure, it's been worth the wait. There's no doubt about that. First time in 60 years, two teams who have never won a World Series square off in baseball's October showcase. Another first. Never before have both World Series teams been led by rookie managers. But Kansas City's Jim Fry and Philadelphia's Dallas Green are given much of the credit for turning around their team's fortunes and bringing about this historic meeting. In the city of brotherly love and baseball near misses, it's time to let go and celebrate. For 1950 seems an eternity ago. Eddie Sawyer, the manager of that last Phillies pennant winner, is game one's first ball hurler. Despite their grueling championship series with Houston, it's a relaxed and confident Phillies team. On the mound is Bob Walk the first rookie pitcher to start game one in 28 years. And batsmen like Amos Otis are just itching to get a crack at the kid. With a man on first in the second inning, Walk gets a rude World Series introduction. It's two to nothing, and Amos Otis becomes the 16th player to homer in his first World Series at bat. In the third, Willie Aikens, another debut performer, celebrates his 26th birthday.
just ask Willie Aikens if it doesn't feel good to be 26 and four runs in front. A couple more base runners put Clint Hurdle in the driver's seat. Hurdle's single sends a call for arms to rookie outfielder Lonnie Smith. Still with a four-run cushion, 20-game winner Dennis Leonard ought to be breathing easily. But there's no such thing against these feisty come-from-behind Phillies. In the third inning, Larry Boa strikes a blow for the bottom of the order brigade. With this team, a rally can start here just as well as at the top of the order. The scrappy shortstop knows that someone has to stoke the coals. It's the third time in World Series history the designated hitter rule is in effect, so batting ninth is catcher Bob Boone. The DH rule backfires on its American League founders as the Phillies' eighth and ninth batters produce their first World Series run. At the top of the order, Lonnie Smith gets another run home. And now it's Pete Rose who'll do just about anything to get on base. That includes getting hit by a pitch. And Rose, one of only three Phils who knows the World Series road, has veteran stadium alive. The Royals' once comfortable lead is now in danger. The potential tying runs are on for Bake McBride, who's batting cleanup despite having hit only nine home runs the entire season. High, deep, and gone. McBride's three-run homer puts the finishing touches on a five-run third. And the Phillies, who came from behind in all three championship series victories, have catapulted into the lead. Two more runs extend the Phillies' lead to 7-4. And the insurance tallies help Bob Walk settle down in the middle innings. But with a runner on in the eighth and nobody out, the massive frame of Willie Aikens is an ominous presence. Aikens' second moonshot makes him only the third player ever to hit two homers in his first World Series game. The Royals now trail by only one. And Bob Walk, who'd later call himself Boom Boom, is replaced by the cool, calm, and collected countenance of the Phillies' placid reliever, Tug McGraw. With two out in the ninth, it's Willie Wilson against Old Stoneface, who never seems to get excited. The 7-6 win gives the Phillies an indescribable feeling, one they've been waiting for since 1915. It's time to play for a knockout. Having scaled one hurdle against the favored Royals, the Phillies are now looking for four in a row. Who better to continue the quest than Steve Carlton, the Phillies' ace left-hander, who faces Larry Gura, the Royals' top southpaw. A far cry from the tumultuous game one, the second outing belongs to the pitchers, at least until the top of the seventh. With the Phillies leading by one, Carlton's sliders start slipping. Three walks load the bases with blue shirts, and the series' hottest hitter, Amos Otis, waits impatiently. A two-run double, and for Otis, a series total of five hits for a royal flush. Come on, 
A sacrifice fly extends the Royals' lead, and again the Phillies must stage a late-inning rally. But these folks have learned to have faith in these times thanks to a late-inning healer named Del Unzer. The Royals, meanwhile, have their own miracle worker, Dan Quisenberry, who earned 33 saves in 1980 with his famed Adam pitch. But Unzer refuses to hit this Adam or anywhere near him. Bob Boone rumbles home, cutting the Royals' lead to four to three in the eighth. A ground out advances Unser to third, and the infield is drawn in for Shake and Bake McBride. The hero of Game One is a hero again. The game is tied 4-4, but the Phillies aren't done yet with their big gun Mike Schmidt at bat. It's one right fielder against another. Once again, the team that wouldn't die saves its best until its backs are against the wall. Another run gives the Phillies a 6-4 eighth inning lead and puts Ron Reed in a position to save it for Steve Carlton. Philly fans just can't wait to move on. For the first time ever, a Phillies team has two wins in a World Series. It's now on to Kansas City, and Philadelphia fans don't care if they ever come back. A city of sparkling waters and Midwestern charm, Kansas City's caught the fever because its favorite 12-year-old is coming home. Kansas City fans have waited a lifetime, and now the whole world is watching. are down two games to none but seven teams have come back after losing the first two so no one's about to roll over just yet In a glittering World Series premiere, Royal Stadium is a smash. The fun's hardly begun when up steps George Brett in inning one. It's a huge relief for Royal fans because the most celebrated case of hemorrhoids in recent memory had forced Brett out of game two in the latter innings. With the hopes of all of Kansas City and an operation the day before, the indomitable Brett is back in the lineup. Dick Ruthven, the Phillies' starting pitcher in Game 3, has the unenviable chore of facing the game's best hitter in front of his adoring legion. Nothing Kansas City and what could be more appropriate the first World Series hit at Royal Stadium is a home run by the one and only George Brett who has in his own words put my troubles behind me the Phillies however are not behind for long and the game stays knotted into the fourth inning when Willie Aikens bats with one out and nobody on For the first time in his big league career, the mountainous Aikens barrels in with a triple. <laughs> Next up for the Royals is their Big Mac, Hal McRae. McRae's single scores Aikens and puts Kansas City in the lead 2-1.
The Royals one run lead is entrusted to towering right hander Rich Gale facing Mike Schmidt in the fifth. For the first time in 19 career postseason games Mike Schmidt gets to display his home run try. The game is tied again 2 2 with Royal fans initial a cheer in the seven. In KC A.O. stands for Amos Otis and the red hot Royal center fielder gets ready to send this ball a W O L. are back on the top side of the seesaw struggle 3-2 but the Phillies don't stay down for long in anyone's playground one more comeback in the eighth and this battle royale heads into extra innings with the Phillies mount a 10th inning threat an encore is being asked of Mike Schmidt while the Royals look for a command performance from Dan Quisenberry Frank White's masterful double play symbolizes the highs and lows of this relentless series. With the Phillies having stranded a record 15 runners, it's the Royals' turn to mount an offensive on Tug McGraw. Despite a pitch out, Willie Wilson steals second base. After a walk, McGraw pitches to the Royals' cleanup man. Willie Aiken stands in with two outs and the potential winning run at second base. Wilson's victory dance brings the 12 year history of Royals baseball to an exultant climax at home plate. long last the Kansas City Royals have won a World Series game and no matter what happens next they'll savor this one forever for the first one's always the sweetest game four of the 1980 World Series and a glorious autumn afternoon in Missouri this day has been proclaimed Kansas City Royals Day Philadelphia still leads two games to one but this team of Royals is fired up and in the first inning the pride of the show me state shows them.
The Royals get six hits and score four runs in the first inning, and the Phillies can never quite pick up the pieces. The series is tied at two games apiece. Dennis Leonard is the winner with a save from Quisenberry and two homers from Aiken. But the most memorable moment of game four came in the fourth. George Brett facing Dickie Knowles. As Fry departs, home plate umpire Don Denkinger lays down the law. I'm just going to stop it right now. We're not going to have anybody throw at anybody, okay? Because if I think you throw at somebody, then I'm going to run you, okay? I will hit the Okay. The message is loud and clear, and Denkinger puts the issue to rest once and for all. Yes. I didn't tell him I thought he was throwing anybody, but I don't want him throwing anybody. If I think he's throwing somebody intentionally, he's got to go. And same for Dennis, okay? With no more conflict in game four, both the Phillies and Royals turn their attention to the critical fifth game. In this, baseball's first all-artificial turf World Series, even the groundskeeper's efforts are intensified. a touch of levity to be found but now the tension is spiraling for these two stubborn ball clubs game five ceremonial first ball thrown out by Bryce Durbin representing the half million athletes in the National Federation of High School Athletic Association the real first ball will be thrown by Larry Gura who's already turned in a commendable performance in game two after a scoreless first three innings Bake McBride bats with one out in the fourth McBride's slow roller should be routine, but Willie Aikens can't find the bag, and McBride is on. Aikens' seemingly trivial error could become the game's first pivotal play, for you hate to put a base runner on with the Major League's home run king, Mike Schmidt, up next. An outside fastball is sent out, way out, and there'll be no carom on this one. The Phillies go ahead 2-0, and Schmidt's second home run of the World Series thrust the Royals into the role of playing comeback. Kansas City gets a run in the fifth, but the Phillies' second rookie starter of the series, 22-year-old Marty Bystrom, is displaying poise beyond his years. Now in the sixth, Amos Otis takes aim. as Otis with 11 hits and 7 RBIs continues to look the part of series MVP. Two more hits and Bystrom walking. Ron Reed relieves and the Royals go ahead by a run. Now Darrell Porter's at first and Willie Wilson connects. From the crack of the bat Porter's got home plate fever. But so does the Philadelphia tandem of McBride and Trio. The Royals lose a chance for a possible big inning. Now in the ninth, it's up to tireless Dan Quisenberry to protect a precarious one-run lead. 
The ninth inning is a lonely chamber of boundless tension and icy resolve. The whole series riding on every pitch. Come on, Mike! Hey, come on, kid! Mike Schmidt leads off. Brett, who'd been playing more shallow than usual, is a forlorn figure, and Schmidt is the potential tying run. Up steps pinch hitter Dell Unzer. Ah, the comforts of home. One man's celebration is another fan's nightmare. And now with the score tied, something's got to give. The uncanny Unzer has been sacrificed to third, and now with two outs, the batter is Manny Trio. Unzer's run puts the Phillies ahead, and this rollicking band of never-say-die Phillies has done it again. After Hal McRae's long fly ball to left falls just foul, Tug McGraw has to catch his breath. The Royals then load the bases. With two outs in the bottom of the ninth, Jose Cardinals at bat. The count is one ball and two strikes. It's a triumphant Tug McGraw, and the Phillies have scratched and clawed and hung on for dear life to take a precious three-game to two lead back to Philadelphia. Game six brings out almost 66,000 fans, the largest World Series crowd in 16 years. A record-breaking television audience is also watching. Getting things underway is Tony Taylor, a Philly infielder for so many of the lean years. But these are the halcyon days of lefty Carlton and lofty ambition. For seven innings, Carlton sends the Royals down with hardly a whimper. But his opponent, Rich Gale, is hard-pressed to keep pace. With no score in the third, Gale walks Bob Boone and faces speedster Lonnie Smith. Surprisingly, the call is safe. The old in-the-neighborhood play fails to impress umpire Bill Kunkel. The Phillies have two on with no outs. A throwing error is charged to Frank White, and the KC skipper is frying. that how can you call a play like that bill come on bill how can you do that there was no play come on bill you don't see that twice a year bill cut the ball right here come on for crying out loud the futility of fry's mission becomes apparent and the manager addresses himself to an ally he's gonna bunt for sure We'll have the play with two charges. With Boone at second and Smith at first, Fry has put his infielders in motion to combat a sacrifice bunt. Pete Rose is the man in the middle of all this as the game assumes the look of strategic warfare. Will Rose bunt or not? With Brett charging, Rose fakes and takes a ball. And with the count three and one, Fry sends his infielders back. Noticing the change in defensive strategy, Rose lays down a gorgeous bunt, and George Brett is playing too deep to make the play. Without a ball hit out of the infield, the Phillies have loaded the bases with nobody out. 
score it a hit for Rose and give the round to Philadelphia. Mike Schmidt the bat. The Phillies go up two to nothing thanks to the clutch swinging Schmidt. The lead then swells to four and holds until the eighth inning when Tug McGraw relieves a tired Steve Carlton. The Royals break through for a run and with the bases loaded it's designated hitter Hal McRae versus designated stopper Tug McGraw. The Phillies have come out of the eighth inning alive and still well from another heart pounder. Still, this slap happy fellow has a truly astonishing flair for drama, and the ninth inning will provide even more. Down by three runs, the Royals load the bases with only one out, and the potential lead runs at home. For two rookie managers, it's the moment of truth. Tug McGraw fires to Frank White, who pops it up. A miraculous grab by Pete Rose might just stand as the most lasting image of this stirring series. After all that it took to get here, the new Phillies can't afford to let it slip away now. It goes in the books as out number two. The Phillies need just one more strike to wrap it up, and Willie Wilson stands in the way. At 11.29 p.m., October 21st, 1980, the ghosts of Phillies' past are finally laid to rest. The team that couldn't win the big one has taken the ultimate, and the fans who never had a champion have a World Series winner. It was 98 years in coming, but as any Philadelphia fan will tell you, it was well worth the wait. The six-game Philly triumph brings tears to the eyes of general manager Paul Owen and Philly fans everywhere. In looking back at the 1980 World Series, there were heroes galore. The Phillies' Bake McBride set the tone of the series, spearheading the first-game comeback with his resounding three-run homer. Amos Otis had a series-high 478 batting average and a bevy of clutch hits for the Royals. Hal McRae, one of only two Royals with previous World Series experience, gave KC a dependable DH. While Willie Aikens conducted a vicious assault on Philadelphia's pitching and became the first player ever to hit two home runs in two games of the same series. Perhaps the most unsung hero of the series was Philly Ironman Bob Boone, who courageously shrugged off a foot injury to bat 4-12 and catch every inning. Shortstop Larry Boa triggered a World Series record seven double plays and led the Phillies in both base hits and stolen bases while adding a boyish enthusiasm. But the most exuberant Philly was reliever Tug McGraw, who won one game, saved two others, and kept everyone's heart thumping. The Royals' George Brett displayed his incomparable batting stroke to the whole world. Steve Carlton, the man they call Lefty, struck out 17 in 15 innings and accounted for two of the Phillies' four wins. And finally, Mike Schmidt, who silenced his critics by winning the World Series MVP trophy, then saying graciously, I'd like to chop it up into at least 25 pieces and give some to all the other guys. One and all, the 1980 Philadelphia Phillies are baseball's world champions.